Good afternoon and welcome to today's virtual Commonwealth program. I'm Sock Rocco Fisher. If you're in the Bay Area, most of you know me as the former president of the San Francisco Symphony, and I am a card carrying member of the Library of Congress James Madison Council. I am pleased to be joined today by the 14th Librarian of Congress, Dr. Carla Hayden, who was nominated for the position in 2016 by President Barack Obama and made history by becoming the first African-American and the first woman to lead our national library. Our library was founded in 1800, and it is the largest library in the world with a collection that encompasses millions of items. It's the main research arm of the US Congress and home of the US Copyright Office. It's an amazing resource. It's a cultural institution that last year welcomed 370,000 in-person visitors and recorded more than 151.6 million online visitors. Um, and also another thing to note is you're the first professional librarian to hold this position since like 1976, I believe. Um, generally, historians get to be, uh, or yeah, historians have traditionally been the librarians of Congress. We'll, we'll, we'll segue off to that in a second. We will welcome questions at the end of our talk. So this is our light housekeeping. If you have any questions for Dr. Hayden, please submit them in your YouTube chat and we will have an opportunity to um, hopefully go, get through them at the end of the program. So Dr. Hayden, welcome. What are you What are you holding there? I forgot, you know, in our prep, you didn't have a book in your hands. Oh, I'm a true librarian. As you noted, I'm one of only three professional librarians that have been Librarian of Congress since 1802. So I can't help but to have a book and I hope I get to show it to you. I, I think we'll audience. probably figure out a way to work that one in. But I wanna start with the question that I'm sure everybody on this channel is curious about. Um, it's, it's kind of a three-parter. What are you reading right now? Uh, what do you read that you don't usually tell people you read? And what three books are on your nightstand waiting to be read and why? I'm reading Louise Penny. I had the opportunity to be with her at an event, a mystery night at the Library of Congress. And we'll so she's a mystery writer? That. She's a mystery writer. She has about 18 novels set in Montreal. They're cozy uh, mysteries. And after hearing her and reading uh, the first two, I'm trying to get to the 18. And what people might not think that I read are books about true crime. <laughs> I got hooked as a child on Hollywood Babylon. I found out about Fatty Arbuckle and all of those things. It was something at about eight or nine. And so I read a lot of uh, that on the side. And when you think about the three books that are uh, waiting for me, because I have different categories of books to read, uh, books that are about exercise and diet are aspirational. So they're in one stack. <laughs> there are books that I should read, a lot of things about AI, for instance, now. And what's happening in that field, and then anything that has to do with the history of books and reading. So that's those are the categories that I could just pick one up from any of those categories. Not so um, much the aspirational. Right. <laughs> we all have the aspirational pile. I give a lot of aspirational books during the holidays uh, to my husband in particular, and his pile is growing. Um, you know, we think a lot about what what reading opens up in our minds. In your journey, what would we, what books were sort of hugely influential with you? So another funny thing I learned about you, you know, besides that we are both brown, we were both brownies uh, growing up, which I think is great. And we we're both huge uh, British historians. But when we look outside, we uncover sort of what's written about you in Wikipedia and, you know, we know all the great facts and, um, but what were those pivot points? Like, because part of it says you didn't grow up wanting to be a librarian necessarily. No. What were some of the points where books started to weave their way into your own life journey and what books 
What, what were some of those books? Well, I mentioned uh, my grandmother, I think, in terms of the book she had about uh, Hollywood Babylon. So books were a part of my growing up. Every summer I would spend in Springfield, Illinois with my grandparents. And I was read to and then uh, taken to the state library because it was the capital and a lady who went to church uh, at the same church was Miss Pendergrass, who introduced me to the wonders, not just of a Miss Pendergrass, yes. Uh, Only the names we remember, right? That's it. And so that's when I saw a grand library. And also, though, uh, my parents were big readers. So I was always read to and then encouraged to read. I found, though, that what really intrigued me, a, a book that made an impression is one that that's the book that I have in my lap. Uh, that I still have, and it was Bright April, and that's what I'm going to hold up. And you can tell that she's a brownie, and we were both brownies. And I'm not sure who put this book in my hand when I went to the public library that was right across from the elementary school I was going to in New York at the time. I was about eight. I was a brownie, and someone put this in my hand. And it was the first time, even though I read a lot and loved going to the library and all of that, the first time I saw myself in a book because I was a brownie, she was a little brown girl. And this picture in particular really struck home because there was a piano in the living room. My parents were musicians and grandparents, all of that. And I just love this book, love this book. And in fact, this is how I learned about library finds because I took it out over and over and over again. And to this day, and they've reprinted it because I think I've talked about it so much, uh, but it was a series of books by a lady, Marguerite D'Angeli, who started writing after World War II, books for children about children from different backgrounds. So there was a, a little African-American girl, uh, an Amish boy, a Jewish girl, a series of books. Uh, she had some difficulty getting them published at first, but it really showed that children needed to see themselves represented, but also have empathy for other kids. Um, so interesting you should say that because representation and seeing self allows children to imagine different kinds of futures and outcomes for themselves when they are actually represented in a myriad of different um, ways. As you think about the Library of Congress, how are you putting attention on sort of diversifying its whole, I mean, we have millions and millions and millions, I'm assuming it's slightly, it's pretty diverse, but are you thinking a bit about what that means in today's context of making sure that people find the authors that represent their lived experiences or their backgrounds? And the history. And when you think about the fact that the Library of Congress, yes, the largest library in the world with 178 million items, the collections are not only of, for instance, Walt Whitman and Ralph Ellison, but you also have the papers of 23 presidents 38 Supreme Court justices and the papers of Rosa Parks and creative minds and performers, Jesse Norman. And so by having those materials brought to life, we call it opening up the treasure chest, people can see themselves in a different way and see themselves reflected. We just received a few years ago, a wonderful grant from the Mellon Foundation to expand our reach out into communities that are telling their stories and to add those stories to the mm. library's collections. And that's been really uh, very helpful. And also to have something that's important, paid internships, to have people from different backgrounds, young people, mainly in college and universities, to delve into the library's collections and help us make them accessible. Didn't you also start a scholarship fund? Is it at the University of Chicago or to help um, uh, people of underrepresented minorities have access to uh, further education in the library science space? 
that's a program that I was very excited to be part of that's sponsored by the American Library Association, the Spectrum Initiative. And that's I was it. the first chair of that. And it also was targeted and still is to give students a unqualified uh, stipend uh, to the student, not to the school, to encourage them to think about librarianship as a profession and to give them that opportunity. You mentioned that I didn't start out as a librarian or dream about it. I'm I'm what's called, and I call myself an accidental librarian. I didn't know about the profession. And so when you think about underrepresented groups, part of the challenge is to let young people know that this is a profession that will allow you to help others. If you are interested in sharing information or you love literature or you love uh, something that could help others, <laughs> librarianship is for you. So quick commercial, but yes, because <laughs> we're it's trying fun. to go down to, to uh, middle school. That's where you really when can actually have an impact. Um, interesting because my dad was also a librarian and I too spent my summers with my grandparents. And then because my parents were divorced, when I visited my dad, I spent my weekends um, shelving books. The Dewey Decimal System was like, if I ever got a tattoo, it'd be the Dewey Decimal System on, you know, in some <laughs> form or shape. Um you know, you have had a very interesting career advocating for libraries over time. You um, have used libraries as, and in a quote, I believe, are as a cornerstone of democracy. How, when people ask you, why do libraries matter? What, what do you say? Libraries are actually opportunity centers in communities far and wide, not urban areas, rural areas in particular, on reservations. They are the places, public libraries are the places that people can get trusted information. They have a freedom, as we say, free people read freely. Um, and now when you look at what public libraries are doing, it's beyond books. People can check out a sewing machine. They can check out musical instruments. They can get online and have an opportunity to file uh, applications for e-government and jobs. So in most communities, that, that public library is that trusted place and that place that is open for all and free. You know, you actually won Ms. Magazine's 2003 Woman of the Year because you protected Americans' rights to be able to search freely uh, in Mac in libraries without um, surveillance, for lack of a better word. Um, that's a pretty, that was a pretty brave stand to take way back in the two, early 2000s. How, how have you feel, how do you feel about that now 20 years later? How do you see um, the rights of, of, of fellow Americans to access information freely? The profession was really adamant at that time, and it was shortly after 9-11, there was quite a bit of concern and about national security. And librarians were, though, very concerned that as people were searching for information about uh, countries they didn't really know about, uh, they, they're typing in jihad, they're doing all of these things, that an interest in a subject would not be mistaken or implied as an intent to join or do something. And so, yes, the, the profession got together. I was the president of the American Library Association at the time, and we took a stand and said that we really want to make sure that people can feel safe in looking for information and not have it interpreted in a different way. And so when you think about what's happening now, for instance, with challenges to certain uh, books, there's a concern that you are cutting off access, especially to young people. I know how much having a book given to me meant to me <laughs> and to see myself reflected. And so to cut off that access at a time that young people are trying to figure out where they are in the world 
could also be something that could be damaging. So that's actually an interesting segue. In the last 20 years, since you sort of stood up for the privacy of Americans to be able to use libraries freely, uh, how have you seen the evolution of libraries develop around the United States? Because in, back in the day, you and I, my dad would take me every Saturday to the library to check out books. And I would check out, I didn't have a very big allowance, so I wasn't allowed to have fines. I don't know how you afforded it. I had a paper route, but I took my stack of books home and then read voraciously and waited for the next Saturday. But the world has changed a bit, and now you can check out sewing machines. And as you said, instruments, you can check out electronic books also. Right. Um, how have you seen the evolution of libraries in the United States today compared to where it was when you sort of accidentally fell into that space? And how are you thinking about it going forward? Well, libraries have evolved with the technology that, as we like to say, freed the information from the container. Uh, you had to take the stack of books home physically. And once you could then download, and now uh, you are not, that eliminated fines. We could just cut off your access, <laughs> sell it your ebook. We were very happy about that. Uh, but you could, you know, it ran out. And that, that evolution went along with you're not spending a lot of time trying to retrieve and protect this container because that's the only thing that had the information and you had to spend a lot of time on that too. What other things could you provide? So maker spaces in most libraries, you have recording studios so young people could come in and, and make their own tapes and do all types of things, but you also are having more author programs places that are, as we used to say, you could battle out, the books would battle it out on the shelf. Well, now you have community forums and meetings. So those spaces and libraries are using their spaces as places, that third place in so many communities. And so that evolution as society has gotten uh, more complicated and more challenges, libraries have evolved and the variety of services that they offer are, are mind blowing, really. That's an, that, that leads to how we think about access. Back when you were ALA presidents, it began in the early 2000s, you, you coined the phrase equity of access, which is a very powerful term. Today, we look at digitization as an opportunity to create greater and greater access. How are you thinking about that? And is that something that like who pays for that? Is that a, are you working on private public partnerships? I think a lot of people don't realize that you also fundraise, uh, that you're not just um, supported 100% by Congress. Um, and, but, but how are you viewing the digitization of your, you can't digitize a sewing machine, but your, your 178 million books and things how are you thinking about that? And how is and, that happening? And who's helping you make that happen? Because it's not like, uh, I've been to the offices. I don't I don't know. Is there a special room? Are there four closets? People are in there, you know, scanning books. I don't know. Well, actually, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we just saw, uh, uh, equipped a new scanning center because that is what you're doing. Um, for the Library of Congress with the 178 million items, 61 million items have been digitized. And I use the term items specifically because we're not digitizing books that you could get, let's say, at a public library, those Louise Penny books that I'm mm -hmm. mentioning or at a bookstore. What the Library of Congress is doing is digitizing the papers of those 23 presidents and putting Teddy Roosevelt's diary online where you can see mm. on February 14th where he crosses it out and says the light in his own hand, the light has gone out of my life because his mother and his wife died on February 14th in the same house. We are putting the unique items online and digitizing those so people can see Rosa Parks pan, peanut butter pancake recipe in her own hand 
Thomas Jefferson's draft of the Declaration of Independence with notes by B.F. Benjamin Franklin and J.A. John, John Adams, all those types of things that will open up the access that you don't have to come physically to Washington, D.C. and sit in one of the reading rooms. You can actually go online from anywhere in the world and pull up those things. And so that's been the emphasis for the Library of Congress. And we work with our partner libraries um, to make sure that they advertise basically that we have these things and that people know that they can go through our digital front door. 85% of the Library of Congress's budget roughly is from appropriated funds from Congress. And that other percentage is made up of gifts, donations, the Mellon Grant, the Madison Council, our philanthropic group that has been the cornerstone of philanthropic. And for the first time, the Library of Congress has a friends group, similar to what you would find in any other public library. It just started about two years ago. So that we have a range of opportunities. And we emphasize that the appropriated funds are necessary for the staff to keep the lights on, to maintain buildings and, and uh, also the basic operations. But what the philanthropic funds allow us to do really enhances the programming, the exhibits, and being able to add to those special collections. Oh, that's... Um... That's amazing. I, I personally did not know about this public-private partnership until about three years ago. So um, thank you for sharing that out. Can I adopt all the books on Anne Boleyn? Can I, I'll just go offline with yes. that later. Okay, thanks. Great. Um, so speaking of the library, what are some of the treasures? When we, oh. I, I, like, when I think about Teddy Roosevelt, that letter, and this is Valentine's Day, right? You know, this a massive loss for him. What are some of the, the gems that people don't realize are actually in the Library of Congress? And the presidential papers are really the papers that show the human side and, and the items that are in those collections of uh, those figures that we know about. For instance, the contents of Abraham Lincoln's pockets the night he was assassinated. And being from and having family in Springfield, uh, that was so moving because you see two pairs of spectacles, a wallet. It was given uh, to the Library of Congress by Abraham Lincoln's granddaughter and uh, a handkerchief that was soiled, all of these, and then the thing that really gets you a button that came off of his jacket. Oh. You, you can't, what would you do? A button, you put it in your pocket. Um, Washington, George Washington's inaugural address first in his own hand. Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton's last letter to Eliza the night before the duel where he says, and all of this is in their own hand. And we, and, and that's what's so powerful with seeing these primary documents uh, that in his hand, he basically says, if you get this, <laughs> it's not good. Uh, and just to see that and know that one, these people actually, uh, you can almost feel it going through our, our, our historian, um, Scott Berg, in fact, talked about how he feels when he, for instance, he's at the library uh, doing a book on Thurgood Marshall, because we have his papers, what, that you could almost feel the, the, the chill of this is, you know, this, this person wrote this, and you can see it, Frederick Douglass. And then something that you wouldn't expect, Mrs. Lincoln, uh, her Tiffany necklace, and bracelet and earrings that she wore to that first inauguration that he had commissioned to her. Uh, so you have James Madison's crystal flute. So items, and another thing that people wouldn't realize, the Library of Congress, for instance, has the world's largest collection of a single instrument, the flute. And when we were able to use, and this is what we're also doing, trying to get the word out more, uh, connecting with, popular culture. So there was 
a kind of pretty famous uh, pop star that we invited who uses the flute. And it was interesting when that was put on the internet, the thing that we were very gratified to see, and we check these statistics all the time, you know, what is the top post? What are people looking at when they go to our website? The main thing that people said after this performer uh, used the crystal flute was, what else does the Library of Congress have? And then you could see, do they have this? Do they have that? Because our performing arts collection, uh, Rogers and Hammerstein, George and Ira Gershwin, uh, Jonathan Larson, who did Rent, and you could see his calculation for the seasons of love. That And, and if I say it, you'll probably, it's going to be in your head forever. Uh, now 500, but you see actually his calculation. Oh. So those types of things are also powerful and what we want to make sure that people can see not just the end product of creativity, but the process. Mm -hmm. uh, I've, I've seen, I, I can guess that performer uh, because she oftentimes performs with her flute in her. Yes, concert. she does. And it videos. was quite something because what she said at the concert, because we were able to uh, let her for just a few seconds uh, uh, have it at her concert, she said, history is freaking cool. And now we have t-shirts <laughs> because that's what she wanted. She talked about the flute and, and that and the library. And so to make it cool, some of us grew up as nerds. And so we didn't have that kind of reinforcement that history is cool. But I think using the collections and making them, for instance, having Comic-Con come to the library because we have- Comic-Con came to the library? Yeah. I, I just had to pull full stop right there. Yes, the Library of Congress has the world's largest collection of comic books. Part of that is an outgrowth of the uh, copyright system as well. So it's one of the largest, let me make this, Make sure we say one, though sometimes we like to say B, but we it's just right up there. But we have the original drawings of Spider-Man and Captain America and Mickey Mouse too because of gifts too, and the artists will give that. So when there was a Comic-Con here in Washington, D.C., we had uh, a table at the convention center and we invited everyone up. And just if any people listening or viewing with us could imagine the Comic-Con people coming up. I was going to say, did you dress <laughs> up as your favorite comic book character? Because I've uh, seen a lot of videos from Comic-Con. It's a slice. It's quite a sight, but here they were because we had it and we brought out the first edition of that and we invited Linda Carter and she came. And now, in fact, she's a member of the Madison Council. Uh, with you. So it was really something. But that's what we're trying to do is connect to the new Lennon Bernstein movie. Oh, right. Bernstein Maestro. Movie that's coming mm -hmm. out. Right. A lot of the movies, for instance, Rustin, that is just uh, coming out. We have the papers of Bayard Rustin. The screenwriters uh, did their research at the Library of Congress. Lynn manuel Miranda was here for his TikTok boom because of the Jonathan Larson. So you will see in the reading rooms some interesting people uh, many times. Ken Burns, most of his documentaries, and he talks about that, were the research. And David McCullough, oh, my favorite. His Wright Brothers book, we have the papers of Orville and Wilbur Wright, and he talks about that in his book. He was wonderful. Doris Kearns Goodwin, Team of Rivals. That's what Don I'm listening Rico. to. That's you what know. I'm. Li I'm listening to Team of Rivals right now. One in of my the best. Car. And uh, I I don't do a lot of uh, contemporary contemporary being sometime you know in the last couple hundred years of history, and that fact that you mentioned what Lincoln had in his pockets because this book is about him and this group of men he put together to run the United States around that uh, during the, right before the civil war, as he entered into that time is amazing. Um, 
She's uh, she makes history come alive, even if you know what's happening. And so when they uh, did the movie Lincoln and she was uh, consulted on that, uh, a lot of the research, of course, was at the Library of Congress. But also one of her research assistants is uh, on the staff here at the Library of Congress, Dr. Michelle Crow. And you will see in a lot of the acknowledgments of books written about history, an acknowledgement of Michelle. Now, do you do much collaboration with your neighbors like the Smithsonian oh. and the National Gallery and the archives? And we're doing even more. Uh, the the big three, and, and in Washington, you know, there's a gang of six, a gang of eight. So now there's the gang of three. And that's the Library of Congress, the National Archives, and the Smithsonian. And so we are working on not only joint and collaborative programming, for instance, around certain anniversaries, the March on Washington, for instance, 60th anniversary, that we make sure that we uh, have on each of our websites what the other institutions are doing. That's a very easy thing to do, but also looking at possibilities for joint, joint exhibits. And then with, you mentioned the National Gallery of Art, uh, all of the other opportunities and partnerships. So in our new strategic plan, that's a big part of what we want to do, make sure that we're more intentional mm -hmm. and forward-looking with those types of partnerships. So um, after Jim Billington, they actually put in term limits. So you will serve two five-year terms, or is it? Well. The, or something thereabouts. Right now, it's two Ten-year terms. Ten-year terms, yeah. Uh, before the Library of Congress, my predecessor, Dr. James Billington, who I yep. knew and was very gracious to me as a librarian. Because, very gracious to many of us, actually. Yes. And um, so when he announced his retirement, there was a, and this actually led to me being, sitting here as a librarian, uh, there was a consultation with librarians throughout the country by the then Obama administration to say, what could the Library of Congress, how could the baton be passed on and what do you need to do? And the recommendation from the profession was that there be term limits. Um, and because of the really continuing and, and accelerated evolution of libraries. And so two 10-year terms. So I'm in the seventh year of the first term. I do want to point out that um, when you were nominated, you got over 140 um, signed letters of support from libraries, publishing companies, educational institutes. It was academic. It was unheard of to have a, the librarian, of the, the head librarian of the Library of Congress to have such a wellspring of amazing support and uh, aspirations that you would be, in fact, selected uh, because, by Congress to fill that. And Sako, I think a lot of that had to do with the, the wish uh, and the hope of those communities and people in and from literature and history and all of those groups that the Library of Congress and everyone know, knew what the library contained and had, mm -hmm. that it would be even more readily invest, uh, accessible. And I was just honored that they thought that this basically public librarian, you know, would really- Truly a public on. library. And so it's been wonderful because that support is still here from that public library community. So we broadcast out, we got pretty good at it with the um, pandemic virtual programming like we're doing now, uh, out to have the National Book Festival that had about okay. over 100,000 people. But one day in Washington, D.C., during the pandemic, we went virtual and we had people that could tune in to over 100 authors virtually. And so we're continuing that. We're still having the in-person book festival, but we're also really looking and making sure that we have that virtual component. So just, that community just, support is still there. 
Well, I think also uh, as the first woman, we're just we're going to just full pause. Eighteen hundred. It was founded eighteen hundred. We're not going to talk about this issue, but you are the first woman librarian of Congress, which is a and but yet eighty percent of all librarians in the United States are women. So we're we're going to put a pause because I get one more question before uh, Q and A. In the time that remains, not our time together, but in your your sort of block of time, what are what are your aspirations for what you have started and got going and created? Uh, are you hoping to achieve when you end up um, terming out of your position? I'm, I'm really curious because you said you're in strategic planning. What is what is the Library of Congress going to look like when you're well physically? Our physical front door, the Thomas Jefferson building, there are three buildings uh, on the Capitol complex right behind the, the Capitol itself. And the main building, 1897, uh, will have, a for the first time, a welcome area, an orientation center that will let people know about the history of the Library of Congress, but also what the Library of Congress can do for them with lots of QR codes and things that can put on veterans history, all of these types of things, and a learning lab for young people. So that will, and right over my shoulders, a rendering of what those things will look like uh, in the near future. And then more awareness generally of what the Library of Congress has, what it can do for them, that people will think about the Library of Congress, that they will know that at 16, they can get a Library of Congress card and that they can have access to the nation's library because it's for everyone. So that new strategic plan, the title for the plan uh, is a library for all. Oh, I really like that. I, I want to be uh, mindful of time because we do have a few questions here in the inbox and um, I can, I, you know, I can talk to you all day. So I, I will, I will share you out here. The first question that's popped in is, what is the most rewarding part of your job and what is the most challenging? The most rewarding part is working with the staff members. I mentioned Dr. Uh, Michelle Crowell, but there's so many other staff members and all. I'm sitting here with professional media people that could, and that's why things look so good. <laughs> that also do the broadcasting out and the programming. Um, so the rewarding part is to see and just be a part of making sure that they have the resources they need to do the best job they can to bring our collections out to more people. And that's also the challenge, the resources, uh, defending going in front of congressional committees and saying this is why the Library of Congress is important and we really uh, appreciate your support and Congress has been very supportive fiscally but also to know that there are other challenges and to be able to uh, keep up with technology we don't <laughs> want to be cutting edge <laughs> uh, but we definitely need to keep up with technology and keep up uh, our opportunities and being able to have those. So that's the challenge. Um, another question is, what is the best piece of professional advice that you've received and who was it from? The best piece I received was from a gentleman in Chicago, John Johnson, who was the head of Johnson Publishing, Ebony Magazine, Jet Magazine, African-American, first African-American uh, millionaire, basically, uh, who, when I was thinking about, should I go move uh, to another position, leave Chicago, it was then my home and library that I spent a lot of professional capital. Um, he said, sometimes you have to move to do better. <laughs> and I thought about that. And it's like, yes, he was right. Sometimes you, you know, you might have to move, maybe it's a mental move. It might not even be uh, a physical move, but sometimes you might have to move to do better. Uh, that's, uh, I can see it can, it can be definitely a mental move as well as a physical one for sure. Um, here is a question on, can you share your thoughts about a growing movement to have books removed and banned from our schools and public libraries? 
And it is concerning. I mentioned it earlier when we were going from interest and intent to removing books or trying to remove books that could be helpful for young people in particular who need to see themselves reflected or valued. And as a librarian, I have to say that parents and caregivers have a right to determine what their own children can read, just like they determine where they go to school, what they eat. As they get to be teenagers, though, I know that can get a little tricky because, you know, a little bit pushback, but that's your right. And that means all parents have that right. And so when you have efforts to remove a book from a public sphere, you're taking that right away from others. And that's where you need to draw the line. If you don't want your child to read it, that's perfectly fine. Thank you. Um, another question. With the library having a history spanning hundreds of years, is there someone that you would have liked to have met and spoken with, and what would you have asked them? That's a good In one. In terms of a historical figure? That's, I'm guessing, this is a, an online or question. Also one of my predecessors, Daniel Borson, uh, who was very... Uh, then I read about him, and when I look at my other predecessors, I'm the 14th since 1802. He really wanted to and did open up the library physically uh, in terms of exhibits and, and having more people come in. So I would have loved to because he was a noted uh, historian and personage. And the other person I would have loved to have talked to is um, Eleanor Roosevelt. She, when you think about her life, and that's another Doris Kearns Goodwin book, No Ordinary Time. Mm -hmm. Highly recommend that one. Do you have her papers? Uh, no, that's Val Kill and up in Hyde Park. Mm. And that's part of the, and Franklin Roosevelt actually started the whole program of presidential libraries. And that's when the archives started too, mm. after World War II. And that's when the division, because the Library of Congress, actually, that's how we got the 23 up to Coolidge, uh, was the repository there. But Eleanor Roosevelt would have been somebody to just sit I, I and would, talk with. I would second that motion. Um, another question. We recently were able to avoid a government shutdown. How does a shutdown affect the library? The library would, and similar to the Smithsonian or other... Uh, entities, because we are a public library, people come in and do that, we would be closed to the public. There would be minimal staff to make sure, for instance, that the safety of the materials, um, mm. that's foremost too, that you mm -hmm. have that. So the buildings would have to have some operation to mm -hmm. keep uh, heating, cooling systems going and things like mm -hmm. that, security. Mm -hmm. would have to be there so there would be staff. But in terms of public services, uh, that would stop even the virtual because that's mm -hmm. a public service. So the website would, from what I understand, the you would still be able to access the website, but you would not get an answer from Ask a Librarian. Right oh, now, if you go to the website and there's a thing saying Ask a Librarian, there's a live person that would answer your question. So it's not AI. It's a it's a human. No, we're not we're not doing that. It's a AI I'm, is I'm only so with that classification that des, Dewey Decimal. The Library of Congress actually manages the Dewey Decimal system as well as the Library of Congress classification system. So that's where we have had some AI putting subject headings and things like that on. I'm going in order, but the question after this one will be about AI. Um, are there any significant changes or additions, infrastructure, technology, et cetera, uh, you wish to incorporate in how the library runs? The technology, and we've been working on that for a number of years to, for instance, make sure that digital is, as our chief information officer says, it's baked in the cake. So for instance, with the new strategic plan, the previous plan, we had a separate digital strategy plan. 
now digital is incorporated mm -hmm. into strategic plan going forward. So everyone in every unit, copyright, uh, congressional research service that serves Congress directly, about four, 500 people that are just dedicated for their research arm. How can we use technology to be more efficient and effective in what we do? And so that is the part, that's the that's an infrastructure now. You have the yeah. physical, but you have that, that's your best. Your just to up. add one quick short question, do you have a goal for how much digit digitized material you want to have accomplished. We'll keep going. We'll keep going because we keep getting collections in. For instance, we just got the collection of Neil Simon, the playwright. And let's just say it's pretty hefty. <laughs> and we've incorporated having the uh, public help us with the program of transcribing. So Clara Barton, uh, they the public helped us transcribe and put up... Uh, those uh, her diaries and letters to Lincoln that hadn't been seen for decades. You know, so cursive is always a, an issue. So we we got a lot of more mature people to help. So you can go online now and and, and do that. That's a shout out so, to the Commonwealth Club. I think that there should be like a little transcript. Oh, it's wonderful. Though. It's it's really helpful because we've also uh, had a intergenerational thing because some of our uh, volunteers who could read the cursive weren't as good on the computer. So we found that we had, we matched them with younger people who were uh, doing that. And it's also a good thing for holidays. If you want to an activity with the younger people in your life. I, I like on. that. Um, okay. So we'll keep, we'll keep digitizing. We'll keep, because more collections for the next at least 50 to 75 years, there will be analog physical items coming in. Wow. Okay. So many authors have voiced their concerns with AI. Can you share your thoughts on this growing technology? Well, the copyright office for, um, uh, has been involved in the last year very heavily because it's involved with authorship and rights and permission. So our copyright uh, division, if you go on our website, in their website copyright, you'll see a lot of thought papers and things about AI and its implications. For routine things, I mentioned cataloging, there's some things that we would are using AI already for. And so we could see that there are some mechanical types of things that people are engaged in library work that could free them to do other things. And so we're looking at it as an aid, but not as a creator of like metadata to describe uh, what an item is, not getting it. Still want the humans to do that. Mm -hmm. Um. Can you talk about the process to verify or authenticate some of the historical documents that are in the library's collection? Yes, we have a, a special department uh, that is specifically charged with that. And that includes everything from uh, testing paper, uh, looking at the provenance. That's the first thing. When our curators and librarians are acquiring materials, that's one of the first things. Is where did this come from? Who, who is giving this? If it's from the family of a chief justice or justice, or it's from the individual, that's a, a easier terms of what you're getting. But it's some of the outside things that you're saying, like a a letter that's supposed to be from so-and-so. And so we have uh, a, a group of people who that's what they do. And they try as best as they can to verify. And sometimes you'll see that people, because we do acquire things from auction or in other uh, types of ways like that. And um, sometimes things don't hold muster. <laughs> I can imagine. Um... As you wander around the library, what are some of what, what surprises you about the people who are there? Do you have like one great story that kind of really 
summarizes your experience of what it's like to literally walk among the carols of the Library of Congress? Well, one experience I had was going through the stack areas and seeing the names, Thurgood Marshall, Clara Barden, Lee Strasberg. We said, wait, wait, isn't that the talent person that was, yes. So it's like the graveyard for famous people. <laughs> you know, you're just going along. But then I saw the Frederick Douglass and I asked the curator, could I just look? Because he famously said, once you learn to read, you'll be forever free. And I spend, and still live in uh, Maryland and Baltimore, so something. And I pulled it out and just a random file opened it. And it was in his own hand, his thoughts on the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. And oh. you could feel the... You could feel his emotions that he was murdered, killed, assassinated. He was crossing out because of the people of color. And later I found out and I asked, could I have a copy of it? And I had the good librarian, uh, the file number, the box number and everything. And I pulled it up and asked for it and the librarian came to bring it and she looked sheepish. And I said, well, what's wrong? And she said, when we look with what you said, you know, box this and that, file that, we found out that that had been misfiled. That was not supposed to be in that box. So here I am thinking, wow. And it's that serendipity of discovery. Mm -hmm. That's what you want people to feel that they're looking for some one thing and then they say, oh, just like you would when you're in the stacks, physical stacks, and you're looking for one book and then you see another and you get a little over there. That's what we want people to have. And that 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 personal experience that I had just encapsulated what we want to do. It was mostly why my papers were late uh, because I'd be in the stack studying and then I'd see that other book, which led me to another book, which then you realize hours have passed. Um, here's another true. question. What are some items or collections that you hope the library will be able to acquire or add? And this is the whole part of being a librarian at the Library of Congress because we, we have a group that is looking at collections that they want to obtain or items. And so they're very aware of our competition, a lot of university libraries, I won't name a few, but there are a few uh, that are right at those auctions too, that are talking to uh, people, historical figures or performers, things like that. Um, and it's a friendly competition. The main thing is you want these items to have a home. So we work that out. Uh, so in each department, and the Library of Congress collects in 470 languages. Half of the collection is in languages other than English. Then we have six overseas offices where they're collecting materials in um, different from different parts of the world. So each department has a wish list, mm -hmm. and there's a that's what some of the uh, trust fund help us do. The Madison Council helps us acquire things and gifts that we have. We have one of the best collections of Civil War photographs. So the library already had Matthew Brady, but through the gifts of Mr. Lillenquist, we are able to do that. So And, and you mean are... trust fund, which is public, uh, private money given. Um, it, yes. It's yes. not the connotation most people have. Uh, having been on this the other side of the mall with the Smithsonian, right. trust means and These are private. Trust, private funds that you can use. And so that allows our... Uh, librarians and curators to be a little competitive because they keep up in each of them, African-American history, all of these areas, each one of them knows what's available and who might. Didn't, uh, did Lionel Richie give his collection? Uh, he has indicated now he's still very active in everything, right. but he is, he has indicated that he will give his collection to the library. And we have another, uh, collection that's coming that will just be phenomenal uh, 
I mean, do you ever like bake cookies and take them, you know, drop them off? I we we make you know? we make sure, you know what we do? We show them how we would take care of their materials. Uh -huh. And that the conservation labs, the care, the, the research that the librarians have done that know how much these materials might mean to them. That's the thing that we really say. They will have a home. With mm -hmm. Jesse Norman, for instance, the opera singer, mm -hmm. um, that's what impressed her the most. When we took her to the labs, we took her to the uh, places where they make boxes specifically to hold uh, the materials. Mm -hmm. And that's when she said, okay. Another question just came through. Can you share what are some of the oldest items that were in the collection when the library was founded? The collection um, in, in the new orientation center, people will be, they can see it now, but it will be put there, um, Thomas Jefferson's collection, his personal collection of books uh, that were in Monticello. And they include uh, a Koran, books on every subject. And he said there's no subject to which a, a member of Congress should not have occasion to refer. Uh, so that collection includes older materials, and we have the uh, one of only three Gutenberg Bibles mm -hmm. uh, on vellum, and that's, of course, 1500, 1450, mm -hmm. 1500. Um, and the British Library and the Bibliothèque Nationale have the other two. So those are that's the other big three <laughs> in terms of national libraries, British Library, Bibliothèque Nationale, and that. And the Library of Congress will have a treasures gallery similar to what just opened at Bibliotheque Nationale and what the British Library has too. So we'll be able to bring out manuscripts, all types of things on a rotating basis. So they're quite so a you few. Have, you have regular exhibitions at the Library of yes, Congress? Yes, yes, there's a couple now, one based on the photography collection, mm -hmm. uh, Wallace Annenberg, uh, funded a curator for two years to go through 15 million photographs. 15 million? 500. Yes, we have one of the, fill in the blank, world's largest collection of comic books, photographs, film. I didn't even mention film. We the David oh. Packard Center in Culpeper that has the archive of Disney and other film. It's just 45 acres in Culpeper, Virginia. So, so, um, so another question just came through. It's funny, I was thinking the same thing. Does the Library of Congress ever lend collections to other yes. libraries or institutions outside of the United States? Yes, and I was part of that uh, going over at the um, World's Fair that was in um, Dubai and in the U.S. Um, pavilion, Thomas Jefferson's Koran was on display. It was second only to the moon rock in terms of the what the public wanted to see in the U.S. Pavilion. So we regularly lend to other institutions, museums, uh, universities, when they're having exhibits in the museum for, for the Bible that's in Washington, D.C., four of the Bibles that are on display are from the library's collection, which is the largest collection of religious texts in the United States. Do you States. have Thomas Jefferson's edited library, uh, Bible? Yes, his or... Federalist Papers. Are you have a we Federalist? have his book. Mm -hmm. his compilation with his notes mm -hmm. on who he thinks wrote which one. Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah oh, that's... It's pretty cool. So his personal books. And Monticello is also going to uh, work on trying to recreate the library in situ there, too. But not with the actual... Do you have a dream? Um, like, is there an exhibition you'd love to, to mount if you could bring enough pieces from all over the world? Oh, it would be, there are all types of exhibits are new. Um, well, he's not so new now. David Mandel is in charge of exhibits. Uh, he came to us from uh, the Atlanta Civil Rights Museum and then the New York Historical Society. So he has a, a list. And one of the ones that we would like to be able to do is with that Orville and Wilbur Wright collection and maybe have the, one of the planes on the lawn and you know, all of this, but that would be quite something. I'd be down for that one. 
And we're just, we're getting close to the end. If, if you could share one thing that you wished everybody on this broadcast and who downloads it or listens to it online in the future, what would you want them to take away that you have learned that has inspired you about the place or the being or whatever it is the Library of Congress is to us as a fellow Americans? That this library is their library and they should go on that website, loc.gov, and just type in something that they're interested in. And I think they would be really at times amazed or just blown away by what would come up. And if they couldn't find it or something, ask a librarian, but that the Library of Congress is their library. Um, I, I think that's that's amazing. I, I, I'm still kind of stuck on the human actually answers the ask the librarian piece. Yes. Knowing that if there's a congressional shutdown, there'll be no IT, but there will there will be no IT, but there will more importantly not be a ask the librarian. Um, my dad always said, go check your funk and wagnalls uh, when he, I asked a question <laughs> or your Encyclopedia Britannica. So I, I very much uh, grew up with that. Um, and I'm just going to ask a really quick question. Is that a model on that pedestal behind you of some of the uh, design changes at the library? Yes, that's the orientation center that is going to be uh, circular. Uh, so you'll get something about the architecture of the Thomas Jefferson building, the first building, uh, federal building to have electricity. So when you visit, it's it's modeled on an Italian palace to show that in this country we build palaces to knowledge. So it's been called one of the most beautiful buildings in Washington, D.C. You'll see Thomas Jefferson's library, about 6,000 volumes. Get a sense of him and you'll get a taste of all of the types of collections that the library has. So that's a model that kind of gives you, we have more, but yeah, <laughs> putting them up on our website too. Oh, that's great. Well, um, Dr. Hayden, I cannot say uh, thank you enough. You know, as always, it's a pleasure speaking with you this afternoon and thank you for all you, you're doing to preserve our nation's history and bringing it to life for future generations. And especially for the work around amplifying lost and forgotten voices in the telling of these stories. I think that um, imbuing your work with the importance of libraries to democracy and as community gathering spaces now today more than ever really resonates with all of us as a place of uh, shared curiosity, a willingness to open and learn together, I hope, but also to continue to uh, value the opportunity and the ability to access information which many countries around the world do not have. And thank you for fighting the good fight uh, on that. And we extend our appreciation to the Library of Congress and the Commonwealth Club. Thank you very much, huge shout out. My mom loves you. She takes all your trips and to you, the viewers, if you'd like to watch uh, more programs or support the Commonwealth Club's efforts in the making of virtual and in-person programming, please visit commonwealthclub.org slash events. Um, I'm Sakurako Fisher. I just want to say again, thank you, Dr. Hayden. And thank you to all of our guests on this program today and in the future. And uh, be well, go off, read a great book, and then share, tell all your friends about it and share it out and go give love to your local library because uh, they're a cornerstone of what makes the United States a very special place for all. So thank you, everyone.